in the middle of a series taking a look at the minor prophets. And uh, these are called minor prophets, not because they're less important, but because the books are shorter, all right? So you can actually read through a, a whole minor prophet in one sitting. And I want to encourage you to do that. Sometimes these are stories that uh, the, the, the minor prophets are books that we don't go to that often. And so uh, we don't always uh, pull them out. But this one today, we're going to look at Jonah. This is one that's actually really familiar uh, to a lot of you. But I want us to look at it with new eyes. And we're going to uh, take a look, especially focus in on one of the chapters of Jonah that we don't normally even get to. It's only four chapters long, but we only ever make it through chapter three. And that, that'll make sense in a few minutes. Now, uh, we have uh, families together. Kids are with us. And uh, there are these little maps. And uh, there's a little chart on the back. And if you're a kid and you didn't get one of these, there's some in the back. And you can go out and grab one uh, off the back, and this will help you kind of follow along the story. The idea for us, for our kids, is follow along this map. Some of the adults are going to be cheating because they want to look at the map too of where the story goes. But on the back, you can kind of draw the cartoon in for the different uh, the different parts of the story of Jonah. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're we'll open the scripture together. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for giving us your word for the clarity that it provides, for the clear call and clear direction that you give us for our lives. And God, I, I pray that you would help us to submit to it, to actually do what it says. God, would you help us to listen, to not just listen, but to understand and not just understand, but to actually put it into practice. And we pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. So you know the story of Jonah. If you've been around church, if you grew up in a church, you've heard this story. It's one that we tell uh, little kids. It's one that we do at VBS, and it's one that uh, we have little videos about and all kinds of things. You're probably really familiar with this story of Jonah. And today, we're going to go through it together. And if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to, uh, to turn to the book of Jonah. We're going to read together from chapter 4, and that's going to happen in a few minutes. But I want to walk through the first three chapters, and you may want to have your Bible, your phone out, so that you can just kind of flip through and follow along. Jonah starts off like most of the prophets, right? All the books of the prophets kind of start something similar to this. This is how it starts. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Because remember, the prophets are God's people that speak his truth. Uh, they're, they're, they're people of God who speak his truth to his people, to the people of Israel, often hard truths. And, and so for the most part, when we start off one of the prophets, the prophet hears this word from the Lord, and then he's going to go and he's going to give this word to his people. And so what we read in the books of the prophets is the message that God has for the people of Israel. But Jonah is a little bit different. Jonah is not a traditional uh, prophet in that sense. In fact, it's very unique because what we find out is he says, go preach to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because of the wickedness that has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. Wait, what? Right? The prophets are, they're God's guys and they, they hear God's word and they go speak that message but we find out that Jonah doesn't do that and what we see is instead of this book being sort of one of the oracles, the, the word that God has, the book is a story about the prophet. It tells the story of what happened when God sent him on a mission to spread the message and he doesn't do it. He turns the other direction. So uh, if you're one of the kids and you're, uh, and you're following along on your map, you'll, uh, you'll know this story that, uh, that Jonah is in Israel. He's over there where there are several red dots. And, uh, and he's in Gat Hepfer, if you're reading that out on the map. He's, he's in Israel. And, and, and here he hears this message, and it's to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh on your map is to the right. It's east, Nineveh is to the east, and, and he's called, go east and preach this message. And the scripture tells us that Jonah goes west, left on the map, just the complete opposite. In fact, it tells us that he goes to, he heads to Tarshish. He gets on a boat that's going to Tarshish. Tarshish is the last port 
before the, the, uh, before the straits that lead out into the Atlantic Ocean. It's all the way across the Mediterranean Sea. It's the last port before the wild blue yonder. He went as far to the west, as far the opposite direction as he could. Now, uh, you know, we're supposed to go, oh man, Jonah, this prophet, he's following God. But all of a sudden we recognize, wait a minute, this guy is, he's doing exactly the opposite. He's going the wrong direction. And if you were, um, if you were, if we were, had time and we were to walk through uh, each of these chapters, you'll find in this first chapter that there's sort of a, a theme word. And the theme is down. He first goes from where he's at, where he's here about it, uh, and on that map it says Jonah starts here. He's, he's up north, and he goes down to a port city in uh, Joppa so that he can get on a boat. So he goes down there. And then, as the story goes, and these kids are uh, drawn in little parts of the story, he, gets, he goes down to the uh, port city. He gets on a boat, and the scripture tells us he goes down into a boat. And then when he gets on the boat, he goes down down below. As they go out into the ocean, uh, into the Mediterranean there, the, this great storm rises up, and it's a terrible storm, and, and uh, sailors are afraid, and Jonah's kind of down in the belly of the boat. He doesn't necessarily uh, even notice, and, and, and the, 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 uh, the, those who are, uh, uh, the sailors are afraid, and there's what's happening. They recognize that something more is going on than just what meets the eye. It's not just a natural storm, and they uh, start asking what's happened, and finally, Jonah admits he's running away from God. And the sailors try to row back in, but they can't do it. It's futile, and, and uh, Jonah says, you're going to have to throw me overboard. And the scripture tells us he went down to Joppa, and then he gets down in the boat, and he gets in the, down in the belly of the boat, and they take him out, and eventually they take him and they throw him overboard, and he goes down into the water, the murky water. And then the scripture tells us that there's a giant fish, a big fish, swallows him up. In fact, scripture tells us that God provided this fish, and now he's down in the belly of a fish. You see, he thinks he's running towards something that's going to give him life. He's, he's going to do his own way, and he thinks it's going to give him life. But really, what he's doing is he's running away from life. Even though it was, seems scary to go to Nineveh, he's running away from that. that. That would have given him life, but instead, he's running away from God. And the direction you run whenever you run away from God is down. It's down, down, down. And he ends up in the belly of this whale, and he's there for three days. And in fact, Jesus, at, uh, later on, will reference back to the time of Jonah when Jesus is going to be in the grave. And it's this marker for the, the, the people of Scripture, this symbolic, they, they, they see this in the depths of the sea. That's this, that's this reminder of, the de of death and being in the grave. And he's in the belly of the fish, and it's this reminder of being in this place of death. And there, there he sits in the belly of the fish. And then finally, uh, uh, after all of this, Jonah finally goes, I've run away from God and I need to turn back towards God. And Jonah prays. He, he turns back towards God. And so finally, Jonah says, God, you know, will you get me out of this? And, 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 and the scripture tells us that the fish vomited Jonah back up. That's how it actually uh, puts that out there. It's a vomit story. That's what you were hoping for this morning on a Sunday morning. You know, this is a good vomit story. And so uh, so the, the fish vomits Jonah back up onto the beach, just pukes him out. And, uh, and then in, we get to chapter three. And in chapter three, God reissues the call. This is what it says. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message that I give you. See, uh, he ran from God as far as he could, but the theme of the book of Jonah is that God's in charge, not Jonah, and not you, and not me. No matter how hard Jonah tried to run away from the will of God, God was still in charge. We, we have this word that we use, we say it's sovereign. 
God is sovereign. In fact, we're a Presbyterian church, and, and uh, sometimes people ask me, what does that mean to be Presbyterian? And it means we're led by elders and a couple things. But, but one of our, our main emphasis, we, we, we emphasize a few things as Presbyterian. One of them is that we have this big picture of God, a God who is in charge of the world and everything in it, a God who didn't just start the world going and then leave it be, but he's, he's close to his world, a God that breathes every breath into us, every breath breath that we breathe is because God has given us that breath, and we're a church that believes that God is in charge no matter what. This reminds us of the uh, Psalm 139. It says, where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee? Even on the far side of the sea, you're, you're right there with me. Your right hand, it holds me fast. Jonah could not run far enough from God, and neither can you. And neither can you. God's in charge. No matter how Jonah tried to get away. God still grabs hold of him and turns him back. And God reissues the call. Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach. So Jonah goes. Now he has to go east this time. And he goes to Nineveh and he preaches this sermon. And in Hebrew, uh, it was a five-word sermon. Here's, here's what it says in the English translation. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's the whole sermon. That's a preacher. I mean, preachers love that, right? Only five, you only had to prepare a few words. Uh, no good stories, nothing. Just 40 days, and the city will be overturned. That's the whole sermon. This is a very big city. Jonah walks through the city and he preaches this message. And here's what's amazing. They repent. Like the, they hear that message. Not a great message. Not a powerful, surprising message. Not, not, you know, not eloquent. They just hear 40 days. And the city will be overturned. And they believe him. They believe in the, the God of Israel. Now, you, you got to know how amazing this is. I mean, these were the Assyrians. Uh, the Assyrians, uh, this, Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. The, the Assyrians were the army with all the power and all the control at that time. They were taking over nation after nation around them. They were powerful, powerful warriors. And, and they had, a, they had a, a very organized empire. This is who Nineveh is. And, and, and as he preaches to Nineveh, everyone in the city hears and believes. They're not God's people. They're taking over God's people. They're wiping out whole parts of Israel. Ten of the 12, 12 tribes are just wiped out by this group of Assyrians. And yet this is the group that hears and believes. Their king hears and he says, let's go into, let's go into mourning. And so they, they pour ashes over their heads and they wear sackcloth and they, they, they fast. And, they, and the king says, then everyone's going to do it. We've been doing wrong. We've been going in the wrong direction. We're going to change direction. We're going to repent. We're going to change and he says, we call it fast, and it's a fast for everybody, Not, and I mean everybody, everybody, even the cattle. So even the cows had to be part of the repentance in this, right? It's right in there. You go, you go look. Even the cows, right? They're all repenting. This is a miraculous thing. It's just unbelievable. God is in charge. God redirects. God redeems this whole group of people through an unwilling servant. It's an unbelievable story. It's amazing. And, and the way that we normally uh, approach Jonah, that's the story. And it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's astounding. It's incredible. It gives us great hope. And then we want to just go, and that's it. We're done. But that's because we often only read the first three chapters of Jonah. We're only three chapters in. God is in charge. God redirects. God redeems. And then chapter four. And when we get to chapter four, we start to dig in to the life of this prophet. What he was actually thinking. 
And then we start to see a reflection of ourselves and we start to get uh, what, what's, what's the bigger picture, this bigger message that's going on in this book. Guys, we, uh, we often miss this all together. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna read all of chapter four um, today. You can do it. You can make it through a whole chapter of scripture, especially it's like 10 verses long, so you're gonna be fine. Uh, but, uh, but we get to chapter four, so we're gonna do that and we'll, we'll take it in little pieces so you're, you'll be okay in chapter 4, we start to see what, what Jonah was thinking. Why did he run? Why did Jonah go the opposite direction? Was he, um, was he afraid? I mean, it, may, it would make sense that he was afraid. The Ninevites were they were a powerful nation. They were a, a nation to be feared. They were, they were known as destructive. They were, they were known to be a brutal regime. I mean, he could have uh, been afraid of them. Or was he afraid of uh, stepping into his own calling? This is something we often identify with. We, we sense that God may be calling us to do something, but we're unsure of ourselves and how it will go and will we be able to live up to our kind of part of this. And so we're afraid of our own selves. Is that what was going on in Jonah? Was it fear that was driving him. Let's read chapter 4 and verse 1. If you have your Bible, follow along with me or you can follow along on the screens. But to Jonah, this all seemed very, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from calamity. Was Jonah afraid? No, it wasn't fear that was driving him to go the opposite direction of God. It wasn't fear of the Ninevites. It wasn't fear of his own no, it, was, it wasn't that at all. It was anger. Jonah wasn't afraid. He was mad. Think about this story. Jonah, Jonah, Jonah's called to go and, and, and change the, you know, preach this message so that this group of people has changed. He goes the opposite direction. That doesn't work out because God's still in charge. God brings him back. God uh, reissues the call. He finally goes. He preaches a very poor sermon. I mean, just from a, you know, from a preacher perspective, very poor sermon. And people actually repent. They all change. They're all renewed. I mean, this incredible moment and Jonah's response is anger. Why? Why isn't Jonah rejoicing? He says, I knew, God, I knew. You're compassionate, slow to anger. You, you don't bring calamity on people. You don't wreck them. He said, God, I knew you would do this. I knew you would forgive. See, Jonah, he wants justice. He wants He wants. Righteous, those guys were evil, and he wants them to pay for it. And you know, we look at this and we go like, hey, prophets aren't supposed to be rooting for people's demise, right? That's probably bad. He shouldn't have been rooting for them to go down. But really, if we think about it ourselves, when we get this, you know, I, because I've got four kids, they all help me police each other. You know how that works out, right? Uh, as a parent, they're just helping me out all the time. They're like, hey, you should punish that one. Uh, they're really, in fact, uh, they've got a lot of grace for themselves. But when it comes to their siblings, they're like, look, the, the older ones say to me about the younger ones, look, if I, if I had been allowed to do that kind of stuff when I was little, I wouldn't be the precious angel that I am, you know, today. And you can't, you know, do that. And, and they just, they're always telling me, you got to punish that one. And we get that because we all, we all understand that. We want, their, we want things to be right and just. We want people to get their just desserts. And, and, um, and Jonah's in that place. And listen, guys, to understand who the Assyrians are, I mean, this is a regime that would just crush people. And they would crush whole nations. Now, it's actually very serious and, and very evil that, that we even have uh, today uh, we have these reliefs. They're called the Lachish reliefs. 
And uh, there, there, it was like a big mural made in relief that was on a wall, and it's been excavated from Nineveh. And it was in the throne room there of the king, and, uh, and we have, they're, on, they're at the British Museum today. You can go see this relief. And it, it recounts the story of the, the, uh, the Ninevite siege on the Israeli, on the Jewish uh, city of Lachish. And, uh, and it re- recounts the siege where they, they, they seized the city and they eventually destroyed it. And you can see on the wall in these pictures, this graphic detail of, uh, of them destroying this city, of them, uh, this, there's big pictures of the battle and what that looked like. And then there was pictures of the plunder. They took everything that was good out of the city before they just destroyed the city. And then, and then there are pictures of, of families being made to march off. They, they sent the Israelites out. They had to go live in other parts of Assyria. They were sent out of their homes. And you can see these families, little kids and everybody, and they're just walking in, in despair. And then it gets even more gruesome. They took the leaders, and there are pictures of this on the wall. They, they took the leaders, and they put them on giant spikes. They put their bodies up for all to see what would happen. And it gets even worse than that as they, they took knives, and, and they have pictures of them using knives on some of these leaders in just unspeakable and unimaginable ways. And they, they, they made giant mural of that and put it up on the wall to celebrate it and to remind everyone what happens if you go against Assyria. This group of people were evil. I mean, they were, they were doing evil things. And, and if you think you, you would, would approach this any differently than Jonah, I'm just not sure. Because of the gravity of the situation. I mean, if I'm in that place, I'm with Jonah. Those people need justice, not forgiveness. And and, uh, so Jonah is like, I I knew you would do this. I knew you would act this way. That's why I went to Tarshish. Because God, you're too forgiving. And listen to uh, what he says about God, that, that quote. He says, you're gracious and compassionate. You're slow to anger. And abounding in love, you're a God who relents from calamity. Those words that he says there that Jonah says in describing God, they're actually from Exodus. He's quoting. It's a direct quote from Exodus. And the book of Exodus, what, what, uh, where that comes from, it, it's this other story. It's the story of the Ten Commandments. You see, uh, Moses has got uh, this people, and they've come out of uh, uh, Egypt, out of slavery, and God's saying to them, he makes a covenant. He says, I'm going to be your people. I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. And we're going to live in relationship with each other. We're going to live in covenant. And he writes it out on the Ten Commandments, and it's taking too long. Moses is with God, and he's writing in stone, and the people are getting fidgety, right? They just can't wait that long. They can see it going on right over there. God, who just brought them out of slavery, is interacting with Moses. They can see that happening over there and they're just getting fidgety so they say we've got an idea let's get all the gold that we've got give me your earrings and your jewelry we're going to melt that down and we're going to make an idol and we're going to worship this idol even though right there we can see how God is has led us this far it's just taking too long and we don't know what to do so let's make an idol God's got just a couple rules one have no other gods before me two don't make any idols they go for number two right off the bat right they're just let's just do this the scripture tells us that uh, God is upset. He's angry at this group of people. He talks about just starting over. Moses comes down and he sees it. And he's so angry, he, he throws the tablets down and they break. He actually breaks the tablets that God had inscribed of the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's this uh, moment of just great calamity. Moses goes back to God, and God's upset, and he's talking about starting over, and Moses pleads for the people, and Moses says, Moses says, remember the promises you made to Abraham to make a nation, and we are your people, God. Moses pleads, and God says, okay. God actually writes out the Ten Commandments again, second copy, right? That's one that when the argument comes, it's a second copy. God makes a second copy of the Ten Commandments. God renews the covenant. With the people. He says, all right, we're going to do this again. And as God is giving Moses the, the second copy of the Ten Commandments, he says, this is who I am. And he gives that description. I am gracious and compassionate. I'm slow to anger and abounding in love. 
relent from bringing calamity on people. God describes his own character that way. And here stands Jonah. And he, he's, he's inherited that legacy. He's, he is part of the people of Israel who only exist because God is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger. Do you get it? Now he wants justice, and there's a there's an and there's another there's another part to that Exodus passage to that story where God says I'm gracious and compassionate. He also says he also says I, I don't let injustice go on. I don't let sin go unpunished. But 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 uh, righteousness and, and uh, is God's. It's not Jonah's. Right, setting things right and punishing sin, that's for God and not for Jonah at all. It all belongs to God. It's out of Jonah's hand. And here stands Jonah. And he says, I knew you would be forgiving. And he doesn't say why. He says, because he, if he was going to finish the sentence, I knew you would be forgiving because you've forgiven us. That's the incredible story of Jonah. This unbelievable story irony really let's read the rest of this uh, chapter if you have your uh, bible follow along with me here this is verse three is it, he says uh, this is verse uh, two is chapter four verse two i knew that you are gracious and compassionate god slow to anger abounding in love a god who relents from sin and calamity now lord take away my life for it's better for me to die than to live jonah is very extreme he's like i just want to i'm so mad i just want to die but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? What do you think Jonah's going to say? Yes, it is right. Jonah had gone out and he sat down in a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter. And he sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Jonah's still holding out. Maybe God's going to burn him down, right? He's holding out. Maybe it'll happen. And then the Lord God provided a leafy plant. And made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. That's the only thing in the whole book that Jonah's happy about. <laughs> very happy about that plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. This is a common theme for Jonah. He wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. That's, almost, that's comedic to me, but that's the answer. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And also many animals. Remember, they fasted too. That's the end of the book. And also many animals, period. We don't know what Jonah's response is. Jonah's been sort of the worst prophet ever in this whole thing. He just went the wrong direction. God forced him back into the right direction. He preaches everybody, changes their ways, and he's mad about it. He's just mad about everything except for one minute when there was a plant that shaded him. And then it just ends. But we see, we're meant to see the, the bigger picture here, right? We're meant to see this perspective of who God is. This God who is in charge. It's completely in charge. But also this, this, this God whose grace is shocking. This grace is just shocking. I mean, it's, it's beyond what we could imagine. You know, we, we, we say, we, yeah, we believe in grace, but what we mean is we believe in grace when it makes sense to us, right? 
We say, oh, we believe in grace, but, but uh, we also have this little math going on in the back of our heads. It's like, well, that didn't quite add up, and they didn't pay their just dues, and we kind of, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're at. And, and this book of Jonah gives us a mirror on kind of how we view grace. And the book of Jonah says God is in charge, and grace is something that God freely gives, and it's God's to give. We don't get to say how. We don't get to be in charge of justice. It's only God's. And he gives this mind-boggling grace. And I stand there with Jonah and I think, but those are my enemies. And they need to pay for that. But you know, there's another place in Scripture where it talks about God's enemies. This is in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, the scripture is just real clear. It says, while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him because of what his son did on the cross. I stop for just a minute and I go, that mind-boggling grace that I don't even understand, it applies not to just other people out there, but also to me. And I'm the one that needs it. And sometimes I don't even understand grace for myself. I, I just want to add things up and I want them to make sense. And I want to be in charge even of grace. And Jonah reminds us, we're not in control of any of that. God's holding us fast. God's directing us and redirecting us. And God offers us grace. A grace that doesn't make sense. He reconciled us to himself through his son on the cross. And you don't deserve it. And I don't deserve it. But it was given to us. That's where we find life. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this book of Jonah. It's a book which makes me laugh. But also, God, sometimes I see myself in it in ways I, well, I'm just missing the mark. Would you help me to grasp your grace? Would you let me rest knowing that your right hand holds me fast? That you're guiding and directing. And Father, would you, would you give me that grace? change me, make me into the person that you long for me to be. We pray this 